My name is Peter Weseman and I'm working at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, which is based in Sweden, an institute looking at all kinds of issues related to peace and conflict, and in particular to the role of arms in peace and conflict. This is my contribution to DubaiDebates.com debate on the Arab awakening, where I will look at the specific role of arms suppliers uh, who supply weapons to countries in the region and these weapons could then be used to suppress the type of Arab awakening, the type of um, protest and demonstrations which we see in the region, whether it is for example in Libya or in Syria or other parts of the region. One particular aspect which I think is very important is the fact that when we look specifically at Libya we see that many of the weapons and equipment which are currently being destroyed in an effort to stop the um, uh, efforts by the regime of Gaddafi to uh, end the rebellion and the demonstrations of the, the, the rebellion in, in the country. Uh, we see that those weapons are often weapons which have been supplied to that country very recently. Weapons which have been supplied by countries in the West, countries which are now the key players in the actions against Gaddafi. It was only 10 years ago that Libya was still under an arms embargo imposed by the United Nations and also one of the European Union and by the United States. Lib these embargoes were then, were then lifted when Libya announced that it would uh, end its nuclear, biological and chemical weapons programs and gave up um, and, and admitted also its um, uh, contribution to certain terrorist activities in Europe and the United States. It was then, after having admitted all this, brought back into the international community. And at the same time, Libya then re-emerged as a potentially lucrative arms market, and arms producers worldwide began marketing everything from small arms to advanced combat aircraft to the country. The leaders of France, Italy, the United Kingdom, Russia, they all paid visits to Libya, accompanied by arms industry representatives. As recently as in November 2010, the Libdex 2010 arms fair in Tripoli reportedly attracted over a hundred companies from at least 24 countries worldwide. Now, with Gaddafi's military in a direct conflict with a NATO-led force, the ironies are striking. Although Italy is now one of the main participants in actions against Gaddafi, it had previously cornered the Libyan market for advanced border security and military, uh, and military helicopters. In being one of the first Western leaders to denounce Gaddafi and call for military actions, the French President Nicolas Sarkozy did only so after the safe return of French citizens from Libya, including engineers which had been working on military contracts in the country. In, 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 in the country. French combat aircraft of the Rafale type, which were first eagerly marketed to Libya up until February this year, now bomb targets in Libya. Some of these targets are, for example, tanks, which in recent years had been upgraded by a company from the United Kingdom, another country which tried very hard to sell all kinds of equipment to Libya. Now, it is very difficult to draw a direct link between those arms sales on the one hand and the violent actions of a given regime on the other. Conversely, however, it is impossible to say with full confidence that arms sales restraint could have prevented large-scale bloodshed in Libya. At the same time, the eagerness with which many governments back the supply of weapons and related security equipment to Gaddafi signaled support for Gaddafi's regime. And furthermore, had certain weapons been bought in time by Libya, then those weapons could have been a major obstacle to the current actions to stop the bloodshed in Libya. For example, Libya was highly interested in advanced surface-to-air missiles, 
which luckily were not delivered just because Libya, Gaddafi had not ordered them in time. There might be very good reasons to supply weapons, national and economic reasons, maybe drivers for such arms supplies. And of course, arms sales decisions must balance a complex set of often contradictory national interests, sometimes resulting in exports to objectionable recipients. Now, these paradoxes in Libya should prompt some deep reflection by world le le leaders and particularly those in the leading arms exporting countries. Following the first war in Iraq, the one of 1990-1991, in which an emboldened Saddam Hussein turned his arsenal of foreign supplied weapons against a peaceful neighbor and then on UN sanctions, sanctioned intervention forces, the international community reviewed its arms trade policies. Guidelines for arms exports were formulated and transparency in international arms flows increased. Arms supplies to Libya and to other countries in the region, in, in the region must be similarly examined, I believe. A critical evaluation of arms supply policies towards Libya is needed to assess how such policies risk emboldening authoritarian regimes and highlight how commercial and national interests may blind governments to the negative repercussions involved in the arms trade. As the violence in Libya continues, and also elsewhere in the region continues or may escalate, and the international community sorts out its next steps, it should not shy away from examining its role in the violent, vi 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 violence it is now trying to end and further strengthen steps to moderate the global arms trade.